Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about the last of our astronomy lectures, and that covers our solar system. Some of the earliest written records of the makeup of the solar system comes from the ancient Greek astronomers. Greek astronomers noticed that some stars appeared to change their position in the sky relative to most other stars. These moving stars were called planets, which in Greek meant wanderers. Many Greek astronomers believed that the universe was perfect and that the Earth was the center of the universe, and this belief is called the geocentric system. In a geocentric system, the Earth is the center of the revolving planets and stars. Greek astronomers Ptolemy, in 140 AD, visualized an Earth-centered universe with stars and planets revolving around the Earth in perfect circles. This idea was widely accepted for over 1,500 years. In the 1500s, astronomers began to question the geocentric system. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus made popular another model of the universe in which the Sun was the center of the universe. In a heliocentric system, Earth and the other planets revolve around the Sun. Copernicus incorrectly suggested that the planets orbit around the Sun in circles. However, in the late 1500s, Tycho Brahe, after careful recording of planetary motion, suggested that they move in elliptical orbits. Brahe didn't have the mathematical knowledge to explain why. In the early 1600s, with the use of his newly invented telescope, Galileo made some important discoveries to further support the heliocentric model. He made the discovery of moons around Jupiter that suggested that not everything revolves around our Sun. He also found that Venus passes through phases similar to Earth's moon. This could only occur if Venus revolved around the Sun. An assistant to Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, continued studying the planetary motions after Brahe's death. Kepler was the one who developed the three laws that proved that planets move around the Sun in elliptical orbits. The Sun may not be the center of the universe, but it is the center of our solar system. It accounts for 99.8% of the solar system's total mass. It's one million times larger than the Earth, and has an interior and an atmosphere, each of which consists of several layers. The Sun is mostly hydrogen and helium, and the interior consists of three regions, the core, the radiative zone, and the convection zone. The core is the location of the nuclear fusion processes that occur in the Sun. Under extreme heat and pressure, hydrogen atoms join together to form helium atoms. The extra remaining mass from the fusion process is converted into energy. The radiative zone is the middle layer. The energy produced in the core moves outward through this layer, and it consists of tightly passed, packed gas called plasma. And the convection zone is the outermost layer of the sun's interior. Hot gases will rise upward and cooler gases sink downward, creating convection currents. The sun's atmosphere also consists of three regions. The photosphere is the innermost layer and sometimes referred to as the surface of the sun. Even though the sun is gas, it doesn't have a surface. The chromosphere is the middle layer, and the final layer is the corona, which extends outward for millions of miles as a stream of electrically charged particles called the solar wind. Areas of gas on the sun's surface that are cooler than the surrounding gases are called sunspots. Sunspots move across the surface of the sun from an upper left to lower right rotational path. They occur in 11-year cycles. 11 years of a large amount of sunspot activity, followed by 11 years of minimal sunspot activity. Prominences are huge loops of gas that originate in the chromosphere and extend outward into the corona region. They can be viewed by te a telescope. Solar flares are bright bursts of light and energy. They release large amounts of magnetic energy and can interfere with our communication systems here on Earth. Increased solar flare activity can also influ influence the intensity of the solar wind. The increased solar wind causes an increase in the number of particles reaching Earth's upper atmosphere. 
and gas molecules in the atmosphere will absorb this energy from these particles causing the atmosphere to glow and the result is the aurora lights that you see in the ionosphere. The inner planets take up only a small part and small distance in the solar system and there are four Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Mercury is the smallest terrestrial planet and the planet closest to the Sun. It orbits the Sun once every 87.9 days and it can only be observed near the horizon at twilight and dawn. It has no natural satellites and no significant atmosphere and temperatures on Mercury range from 297 to 801 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. Venus's density and internal structure are very similar to Earth's, but in other ways Venus and Earth are very different. Venus's year is 224.7 days. It's the brightest natural object in our night sky after the moon, and it is often referred to as the morning or evening star. Venus is also covered in a thick layer of highly reflective clouds of sulfuric acid. Now, supposing that you could survive that, it also rains diamonds there. We're going to skip the Earth because you kind of know about that one. We'll go straight to Mars. It's called the red planet because when you see it in the sky it has a slightly reddish tinge. This reddish color is due to the breakdown of iron-rich rocks on the surface which creates a rusty dust that covers most, most of Mars's surface. Mars also has ice caps at both of its poles, and scientists think that a large amount of liquid water flowed on Mars' surface in the distant past. The outer planets are the gas giants, and there's also a planetoid called Pluto. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are not much larger and more are much larger and more massive than Earth and they don't have solid surfaces, which is why they're called gas giants. Pluto is very small and rocky. Jupiter is composed mainly of the elements hydrogen and helium. It has a massive storm that has been lasted for more than 300 years called the Great Red Spot. The astronomer Galileo discovered Jupiter's four largest moons called Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Incidentally, we are testing out some uh, life-sensing equipment in the Antarctic that is intended to go to Europa, which is ice-covered, to see if there is any life on that moon. It is possible that it does exist there. Saturn has the most spectacular rings of any planet. It is the second largest planet in our solar system, and it is composed of hydrogen with small proportions of helium and trace elements. The rings of Saturn are mostly ice particles with small amounts of rocky debris and dust, and there are 61 currently known moons that orbit around Saturn. Although the gas giant Uranus is about four times the diameter of Earth, it is still much smaller than Jupiter or Saturn. It has the coldest atmosphere in the solar system. Temperatures get as cold as negative 371.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uranus's axis of rotation is also tilted to almost 90 degrees of vertical. Neptune is a cold blue planet with visible clouds. Along with Uranus, Neptune is considered an ice giant because it contains water, ammonia, and methane-based ices. And finally, the planet that's no longer a planet. Pluto is now considered a planetoid. It has a solid surface and is much smaller and denser than the other outer planets. It's now considered a binary dwarf with its moon, Charon. We used to think Charon was its moon, now we consider it a binary dwarf planetoid. The main parts of a comet are the nucleus, the comet, and the tail. Most comets have two tails, a bluish gas tail and a white dust tail. Most comets also revolve around the sun in very long, narrow orbits. Gas and dust tails form as the comet approaches the sun. Most comets are found within one of two distinct regions of the solar system, either the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud. 
Most of the asteroids revolve around the Sun between the orbits of, the Mar of Mars and Jupiter. This region is called the asteroid belt. Currently, there are over 100,000 known asteroids. The largest three are Ceres, Pallas, and Juno. A piece of rock or dust in space is called a meteoroid. Their origin can be from comets or asteroids. When a meteoroid enters Earth's atmosphere, it's called a meteor. Contact with the gas molecules cause friction, which then creates heat and a streak of light. So we can see them streaking across the sky, and these are the falling stars that people wish upon. Meteoroids large enough to strike the Earth's surface are called meteorites. So now we're going to focus a little bit closer to home by taking a look at the relationship between the Earth, Moon, and Sun. The Earth moves through space in two major ways, rotation and revolution. In rotation, this is the spin of the Earth on its axis. Earth's rotation is also what causes the day and night cycles, and the period of rotation is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. So it's almost exactly 24 hours. In revolution, the movement of the Earth is around the Sun in its elliptical orbit. One complete revolution around the Sun is called a year, and one year for us is 365.25 days. That's why we have a leap year, because every four years we add this extra day onto the calendar to recalibrate the time with the Earth's revolution. Near the equator, sunlight strikes the Earth's surface directly and is less spread out than near the poles. Earth has seasons because it is tilted on its axis as it revolves around the sun, and as a result, the height of the sun above the horizon varies with each season. The strength of force of gravity between two objects depends upon the masses of the objects and the distance between them. If the masses of the two objects are larger, then the force of gravity is larger. If the distance is closer, then the force of gravity is stronger. Inertia is the tendency of an object to resist changing its motion. Isaac Newton developed three laws to describe the motion of objects. Newton's first law states that an object at rest will stay at rest, and that an object in motion will stay in motion unless another force acts upon it. Newton concluded that two factors, gravity and inertia, combine to keep the moon in orbit around the Earth. The moon rotates once on its axis in the same amount of time as it revolves around the Earth. A day and a year on the moon, therefore, are the same length. Because of the equal rotation and revolution, the same side of the moon always faces the Earth. The phase of the moon you see depends on how much of the sunlit side of the moon faces the Earth. When the moon's shadow hits Earth or Earth's shadow hits the moon, an eclipse will occur. There are two types of eclipses, the solar eclipse and the lunar eclipse. The moon's orbit is tilted about 5 degrees relative to the Earth's orbit around the sun. Only when the sun, Earth, and moon align themselves in the same plane does an eclipse occur. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes directly between the Earth and the sun, blocking the sunlight from parts of the Earth. During a lunar eclipse, Earth blocks sunlight from reaching the moon. The moon also affects our tides. Tides occur mainly due to the differences in the force of gravity between the moon and different parts of the Earth. When the Earth, Sun, and Moon are in a straight line, a spring tide occurs. When the Moon is at a right angle to the Sun, a neap tide occurs. Spring tides are when there is a greatest difference between low and high tides, and neap tides are when there is the smallest difference between these low and high tides. Features on the Moon's surface include maria, craters, and highlands. Maria is Latin for seas. Galileo believed that they were oceans when he first observed them with his telescope. Maria are large, flat land areas formed from hardened rock and ancient lava flows. Highlands are the hills and the mountains on the moon. 
they appeared as light-colored uh, objects on the surface. Craters are caused by large meteoroid impacts on the moon's surface. Maria areas have few craters, suggesting that most of the moon's craters were formed early in its history before the Maria formed. Also, more meteorites strike the moon because it has no atmosphere, and therefore nothing burns up before it hits the surface. The moon is 3,476 kilometers in diameter, which is a little less than the distance across the continental U.S. The surface temperatures on the moon range from 266 degrees to negative 292 degrees Fahrenheit. The moon's low gravity, which is one-sixth of Earth's gravity, allows gases to escape into space, so the moon has no atmosphere. It also has no liquid water, but there may be frozen water near the poles and on the back or dark side of the moon. Okay, that concludes the lecture on the solar system. I hope that you definitely take a look at this material in your textbook because it's going to go into a lot more detail than the basics I'm giving you here today. Have a fantastic day.